Okay, we're actually at nine o'clock, so let's go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, we need a roll call. We need a roll call. Here. Carrie Snow. Here. Black Pepper. Here. Jenna Reed. Here. Carol Dominguez. Here. Molly O'Donnell. Here. Kendra Daniels. Here. Sarah Arney. Here. And Tracy DeFrancisco. Here. Okay. So we need to look at the minutes and approve the minutes from the August meeting. Uh, I've looked over them. I, I haven't found any concerns. Maybe somebody else has. If not, I need a motion to approve. Go ahead. Second. I'll second it. The minutes have been approved. Have been approved. Motion is second. All in favor say aye. Opposed? Okay, good. Those are passed. Public invited to be heard. Me and you are this Organizational updates. I don't think we have any other than um, generally working to hire in our community manager positions, I should say assistant community manager positions, um, and then a couple of other moves internally, our um, administrative assistant that we had helping us up at the front desk and just generally with administrative help, she has taken a position within LHA as assistant community manager, so. Yes, um, so. Here. So we've got um, some people moving within the organization, which is good, they're career moves. Um, so we do have a little bit of hiring going on, uh, but they're still on the process of getting started. So, and all of that organizationally, and all of the, we had several moves actually. Not related to LHA, we had an executive assistant move uh, through HCI into internal services. Um, and as part of the budget issues we were dealing with the Mitchell were fund, and really, frankly, we probably should have done this in the care we're tired. Um, I, we uh, downgraded the executive position to an administrative assistant position. We now upgraded the administrative assistant to an office assistant position. And they're now all going to be reported to Erica. And Eric is now an administrative supervisor. Um, and that's in part because Molly's now in our office, Christina's in our office. Um, the administrative assistant will be office in our location and on, on the other side. So we just it's more efficient. Um, and Erica knows all and can wrap her arms around everything and I think it's easier for finding that a lot of folks are doing the Erica anyway. And so it's easier for Erica to manage the schedule and then that provides better coverage for those things. For both sides. That's officially a there. Officially did that. She took her job. She's been doing a lot of that role anyway, whether she was just as a mentor or whatever. Okay, that's all. I think we have another position. Okay. Development and project updates. I'll take this one as well. Um, so, Village on Main continues construction. We will be substantially complete by the end of this month with a couple of final tie up things in October. But I was just over there on my way in this morning to take some pics and it is really looking awesome and it is coming together. Flowers are going in right now. Um, and so we'll be setting up a grand opening of sorts probably in October. So of course we all will be invited to that. So come and see. Excited. So things are going well. We are generally under budget so we are actually looking for ways to spend the money which we're a little bit you know as you get closer to the end there's only so many things you can do with lead times and such but we're um, doing everything we can to get everything that squeeze every dollar out of it that we can. Mm -hmm. um, 
the residents are all, the last move-ins are coming back. So we're done with our hotel moves, temporary hotel moves, and I think everybody's happy to be back home. Um, although we didn't get any complaints about the hotel, so I think everybody had a fun little time there too. Um, for Ascent, so I, I should probably preface some of these for Melissa's onboarding purposes. Um, so Village was 72 units right here on 6th and Coffin and, and Stratton with Maine as well. Um, we did a resyndication of the tax credits and a big rehab. Um, it's about a $7.8 million rehab. Um, and so we've been doing that since January. So back story on that, what we were finding with Village was that when the housing authority purchased it from a private owner about 15 years ago, yeah. They yeah. actually just issued, really, uh, got the money from Chapa to the tax credit bill and just purchased it. They really didn't do a lot of work to it. And so what we were dealing with is really the interior was 30 years old. And Chapa has changed the rules to say you need to be at 20, at least 25. And they let this one go through because of the fact that Something I've been done for years. Yeah. So I was younger there, um, and I noticed the kitchen, and I love the way that that's kind Isn't of the really Yeah. Yeah. So there's things. Did you notice that the giant hole in the ceiling, the big old commercial hood? Yes. That's still left over. We're trying to get that well, sorted out, that but that's a permitting situation. It is. It looks like that. It looks like Santa to come down that thing. Um, <laughs> So there's a lot of stuff like that. Last final touches, um, and it's all carefully coordinated so that we don't jeopardize our building permit, substantial completion letter, which is what we need to give to the investors for tax credits, all of this. Um, so any other questions on Village? The, I think the units are really nice. I think they're, they're they do not, I mean, we never strive to make them look like affordable, but when you see some, they do not look like affordable. They have, um, shoot, what's the word? It's not uh, quartzite countertops. Mm -hmm. I think it was. Um, and they've got there's just solid cabinets, and it looks really great. I'm going to be um, presenting at Housing Colorado in October, the big uh, affordable housing conference, um, about how to use CDBG funds most effectively to support affordable housing, and I'm. That's why I went over to got, get some pictures to to share a little bit of that village and how we did that. Um, okay, so Ascent, that is our 75 units of family housing, including three and a good number of three and four bedrooms, which is a major challenge to finance on the tax credit side. Um, it has an attached early childhood education center, so we're working with Wild Plum to bring that together. Um, and we have been in closing mode since July. It is a really complex one when you add on a commercial use like that. Um, and so we've been working through things. Right now the closing is scheduled for, it should be the, should be next week. Next, by the end of next week is our closing schedule. So we can um, start digging. We, we can start digging as soon as that's ready. We've got the construction sign ready to go, just need to be able to hang it up. Um, so that one is in full closing mode. A lot of attorneys talking right now to get everything buttoned up. When are we the time of the two time even for closing? It should be by the end of next week. Just signature pages. We'll be doing signature pages several days ahead, like we did last time to work that well. Um, you'll need to be here for the day. Yeah. yeah. You'll be here for the day. Right, yeah, no, that's why we need to solve it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, there, there's a call this morning to, with, we're meeting now twice a week just to make sure everything is uh, tracking. Um, so we'll be in full construction mode here soon, and that will be constructing through about January 26. So that's when we expect to open. We have a couple other things that we are uh, planning out for the future. Um, 
the several things on our list for the next round of what do we want to do is uh, trying to get the Hearthstone and the Lodge. It's, it's similar to a resyndication of tax credits, but it's different. It's like a conversion to what Hudson calls a RAD program. Uh, but it will be an opportunity to re refinance and do some level of rehab as well. And then we're talking about trying to um, see how LHA could be involved in a middle income housing, rental housing project. So there's some top one, two, three opportunities out there right now. We're trying to see if that could fit into and just looking for grant funds to get it started. I think that's it for project updates at the moment. We're going to talk about Zinnia later on. Well, Zinnia, I can, so I can definitely say Zinnia. Zinnia is, is wrapping up construction and um, we are in the lease set process right now. We are more than halfway leased. That was the number, that was a number about a good week and a half ago, so I'm sure we're further by now. Um, with an anticipated move-in of October, there will also be a new for opening ceremony for that one in October. Um, and so we're at the point right now where we're just coordinating final construction cleanup and coming back in and restriping the lot, which <coughs> actually happened Friday. Oops, I'm gonna go check that out too, because coordinating a lot of um, with their construction teams because we also have ADA upgrades to do on the parking lot, so we're coordinating together to try and kill two birds as much as we can. Um, and then we'll be doing some more, there's there's more parking lot work to do once the construction vehicles are out. So just a couple of little things. Giant, giant <coughs> holes. So uh, that's all coming together. We're gonna try and get the concrete all in before the season shuts down. So. So I have a question about the residents living in there. Um, can you give me an idea of what kind of residents is going to go in there? Are they going to be people with felonies or misdemeanors or are you, are you looking at? So we did review the tenant selection plans with this group several months ago when we were, uh, before we finalized them. So half of them are going to be pulled from the local Boulder County case conferencing list. That means There'll be people that are exiting homelessness that are tied to Boulder County and going through Boulder County's process. And then half of them, and this is a requirement of the state <coughs> That's, that's a coordinated entry. Coordinated entry, yeah. Um, half, the other half come from essentially a statewide list. It's Metro Denver housing initiative list, which could be, it's got statewide people on it. Um, that is a requirement of the state funding. And so, uh, Often, often the more the, those with a local tie often have a lower acuity of need because they have some connection to the community or they have uh, jobs here or family or some connection. Sometimes, not always, if they're coming from that statewide list, they are a little bit harder to house. They don't have as many community connections, and so that's one of our tasks is to build that community. Um, okay, so then, so that's where they're coming from, where their referrals are coming through. And the Boulder Shelter for the Homeless, which is now called All Roads, is managing all of that. And they are doing the case conferencing and working with people to get them ready. Um, our tenant selection plan, it is meant to be for hard-to-house individuals exiting homelessness. So they could, there are a couple of things that are no-go's which are uh, convictions for production or distribution of meth and uh, lifetime registered sex offenders. Anything other than that, there are some denials. It, we can deny them for certain things that are lesser than that, but then there's an appeal process where they can come and tell us, have you been in counseling? What are you doing um, to address substance abuse? Trying to just tell us what their life history is beyond the background check. Um, and so that is different from the suites. The suites has a tighter <clears throat> tenant selection plan and we follow federal rules there, whereas the Zinnia follows state rules. Um, and so <clears throat> it is a different tenant selection plan. The suites we are trying to gear towards more lower acuity of need people, which we've uh, managed in a couple of ways by changing that tenant selection plan because it's an older PSH project. It's a hotel conversion. It wasn't purpose-built to be able to handle this. 
and Zinnia is coming in with 24 hour security and dedicated case management that's funded all the way through, which the suites, when that was created, did not come with that structure. So it's, it's going to be a challenge that we, it's up to us and Boulder Shelter and Mental Health Partners and the owner of Zinnia to create community and get people connected to the resources they need and manage the culture. I'm just kind of concerned about whether or not we're going to have, which we may or may not, a lot of police calls over there, or how are we protecting our people at the suites if there's so many, you know, ornaments, so. Yeah. And, and we're all calling. And we've heard, it like, we've heard it both ways, too. Yeah. So that is up to us, and that's why we've been putting tools into place for some time to be ready for this where we have the two clinicians on site at the suites. We've got a third still that we're hiring for, um, trying to get as much supports on site as possible. We've got Recovery Cafe coming on site, and their intent is for them to do something at Zinnia as well, to um, have just bring in the resources for people. Things at the suites have been quite quiet, and I do think that the clinicians on site, solid staffing, Recovery Cafe, and just opportunities to build community have made a difference. And so we have to build on that success and keep it going at Zinnia and build community across the communities too. So we've got full time evening and weekends security at Zinnia. Yeah, if I understood you correctly, uh, security at, I mean, at suites. At Zinnia, it's going to be full time yeah. security. So we're pretty well. Sort of. okay. Between clinicians, between our LHA's clinicians at the Swedes, all roads clinicians at Zinnia, plus security, plus property management and maintenance. The having more more people is, is better is what we're finding in the model. And our property management will also be property management as yeah. okay. it'll be the same team working across both. So that's actually the Diana, who has worked for us for two years up here, handling everybody that comes to the front counter, which is, those are people that have having challenges, and she has really worked well with them in working through what, they're, what they need. So it's a great experience. And then she's actually going to be the assistant community manager at Zinnia and the Suites, uh, working with Jana. Okay. And so I'm really happy about that because she really knows our residents, knows what challenges they face, and I think she's well in the pool. Okay. I, I, you know, I'm not, I do not have rose color, color glasses. We're, we're trying to prepare. It needs a lot of preparation to make this successful for everyone. So. So I assume that we will get from Sarah an idea of how many police calls are going on everywhere, even it's going to be a lot going on there. So. Okay, the property will not, we're going to get calls for service, but it will not be under the crime free program. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we're going to do all the things, but we can't call it that due to the kind of selection program. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't see it being much different than what we're doing. Okay, well, that's good. All right. And you know, what the Bluebirds, at least at the Blue start, is super you know, quiet. Super quiet, but I think it's really about having the resources there. So um, I think lesson learned on Zenia. I mean, the suites is really the first permanent, one of the first permanent supported housing projects in the state. And so I think you may have been on the board. One of the challenges that we had at the suites was that when they financed the project, they had security, permanent supportive services. They had services there like for only two years. And then when the two years ran out, everything went away. And so then the housing authority at the time was really scrambling and uh, trying to find the money to have security. And, did, but they didn't. 
And, and so I think lesson learned from that project was this needs to be built in the financing model of perpetuity. And so everything we've been building up the suites to get security there, to bring clinicians in, are things that are built into the pro forma Virginia um, to be there and not go away. And I think that's where we lost it. Sarah, I'm looking at you. I think that's when it went south at the suites was really when the funding went away and mm -hmm. all of those services. Right. And literally no one was there. Yeah. And so people started acting up. We're also Sarah's um, working with um about milestone and then camera on the camera, so the cameras are gonna be pretty important. Um, with that too, we, on the city side of the budget, um, we put in our access control system is going down here, so we need to replace it. So we put in 1.7 million in the city's budget to do our access control. <clears throat> and so once that system is up, I think it will give the housing authority the ability to shift into that access control system, which Part of the reason we went with that group in Milestone is it's not proprietary and it can actually integrate in with the cameras so that when somebody's accessing it, you can see who's coming in. Because one of the biggest challenges in the suites is that people get in that aren't supposed to be there. And one of the things that Sarah and I talked about is. The challenge to the suites, as well as going to be a challenge to zoning it, is as much for the people that are surrounding the area and impacting the residents there as it, I think now that's where we're seeing the problem. It's not necessarily the residents, it's the people that are coming in and out of the area that are either trying to sell drugs, camp there, things like that, that are, that's now becoming the biggest issue. So all of this is going to have to work. Pardon? No, it's still there. Probably, yeah, I mean, it will be. And I think that's why the cameras are so important. And that will help security because, you know, we're going to transition to security to where they will have access to the cameras at all the properties. And so instead of going from through the properties, it's going to be more of a camera monitoring. So they'll have ways to see what's going on and what's going on. Is the security such that uh, they're going to sort of lead an idea of who's who there? I mean, it's not that many units. Is it going to be kind of the same security people hopefully coming in and getting a feel for, um, I mean, not knowing everybody's name, but getting in general? Yeah. Well, that would be like a, a hired person. Right. Um, they put in, we, we did it, we, um, we tried, procured, and they, it was on a budget. So they're using who they use on the paper, right? Yeah, it just seems like they should be able to get a sense of who's a resident and who's, like you said, people who are not needing to be there. I think they're fairly quickly if it's a lot of the same people. Yes, and from my understanding, Mom, and correct me if I'm wrong, but security will be, they can have guests for so many months initially, and then they'll have, they'll have a, basically take their ID, they come in and so they'll they exit and get their ID back. I think having that structure will be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so Sigma and the reason why I asked the question is yeah, yes, they have relationships with people there. Um, and get to know them and talk to them. And so that actually is going to that's where it's way open yeah. in terms of the work and then, and so now they feel trust with the other residents and you know, the reports are great and, and so uh, they're really good. Expensive, but good. Yeah. 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 Y
get what you paid for. Yeah. 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 No, you really, I mean, the one we had before, they were falling, the one we tried, they were falling asleep. Mm -hmm. And that's why we went to the attendant model, but then that didn't work, and then we went back. Yeah. And so. All right. And as for input to the Board of Commissioners. Sure. So I'll take the first item here. Um, so we are, we just got, you don't have this information in your packet because it just came in from our outside council yesterday. Um, but we do have all the documents ready to transfer Spring Creek from LHDC, is their role in the general partner, is their place in the general partner role to LHA. So rolling back, we've been working on this for two to three years. Uh, when LHA first came under the city umbrella, uh, we hired outside council, which is like the best outside council, I think, for affordable housing purposes, especially when it's this nebulous question um, that said, can you look at LHA's portfolio? And uh, for those projects that have LHDC, our housing development corporation uh, in the role as uh, in the partnership ownership model does it make sense for them to stay there because at the time LHDC was considering um, like should they still be around because LHA had kind of stopped that development um, pattern but then when uh, the city came in we did react the development pattern but a lot of it was, was with LHA as a general partner because we were or at least a participating partner, because we were going out and using private developers to, to carry the heavy load. Um, so LHDC has, we still uh, meet with that board four times a year, and they still have investments, and they still are in the ownership structure for several properties. And so we asked those attorneys to tell us if it makes sense to transfer those assets to LHA <coughs> or leave them where they are. And they said there are some advantages to moving them, uh, but as we went through the last two years of work, figuring out what those steps were, we realized that Fall River must stay with LHDC or else there would be a significant tax implications and some other things. So LHDC is going to stay on with us for that property, but also uh, because LHA could use still many larger housing authorities use a 501c, 501c3 nonprofit arm. Um, as a mechanism to take donations, to do more work, etc. So they're kind of morphing their, uh, their intent for what they want to provide for the LHA. But it will still be in on for Fall River. And then we um, also looked at Spring Creek and Christman 1 for the other two that we looked at closely. Harston and Lodge also are LHDC properties, but the two removal from this little two program would take care of that one. Um, so, focusing in on Christman 1 and Spring Creek. Um, Spring Creek, there was no real uh, you know, roadblocks to doing it. So, we've gone ahead and drafted the documentation to um, switch that over to LHA being the general partner. And so, there's a bunch of documents that go with it. But, in, a, in essence, it's just um, rearranging you know, the loan documentation, the guarantee documentation, um, and so we will be bringing this to the board, hopefully next week at the LHA's board meeting. It might be October if we need our attorney to do uh, any more heavy lift on this, but uh, we're going to check that out this week. But that will be coming, where we will be transferring that out of LHTC to LHA if LHA board accepts it. Um, and then Crispin 1, so Crispin 1 is the first kind of private development uh, partnership model that the LHA entered into before it became under the city umbrella. And so with that one, uh, the idea is that now that we have Christmas 2 as well, in approximately 2028, there's a couple of milestones that need to be met, but both will transfer to LHA as, as the primary owner, um, away from the current private developer. Kind of like a fee developer situation, but they are on it through stabilization and making sure that they uh, can pull their full fee and the, the income that they needed out of it to make the deal work, and then they'll transfer it over. But uh, Christman 1 had LHDC on it when it was done in... Actually, actually, 
2018 before I mentioned the end of the study. Um, so what we have decided with that one, with the LHDC, is that because in approximately 2028, in order to get the LHA on the general partnership anyway, it doesn't really make sense to do it twice. Um, so we could either do it now with LHA, LHDC, and MGL, the developer, there's three, and it would be removing LHDC and putting that bucket into LHA's bucket, and then we just have the two, and then in three years we come and remove that one and it's just LHA. But there wasn't really any tax advantage to doing that now versus 2028, so we've just decided to hold and do it all in one fell swoop. So Spring Creek is the only property under LHDC that it will be transferring to LHA. And then they're hanging on to the rest of it. So that is something that's coming up. It's been in the works a long time. Um, it doesn't have a huge impact to operations or anything necessarily, um, but it just makes sense in the, the new model of LHA to have this more consolidated. So that's that. Okay. Okay, Ken, it's you. <laughs> Talking vouchers. So um, we didn't bring this to the last advisory board meeting, um, but we did bring it to council last month to explain the situation with our voucher program. Um, we are currently in a shortfall, and the reason for that is HUD in their 2020 project or 2024 payment standards. They really increased them quite a bit. Um, I think they also realized they might have miscalculated, um, which has caused many housing authorities to be in a shortfall right now. Um, and, and what else attributed to it is tax increases. So the landlords are getting tax, you know, property tax increases. They're having to increase the rent, um, and we're seeing kind of a drastic change. So to give you an idea, in January, our cost for our vouchers was five hundred. Six thousand today, it's now so it has increased dramatically. The two year tool, even though we were vouchered up and we stopped actually vouchering in July of last year, so we could prep to add the PBDs to village on main, we don't have the budget to add um, because these increases are drastically causing us to be a million dollars short. And we're finding it's happening to a lot of housing authorities. So they have changed the payment standard and they've already released it for 2025. And it's considered considerably less, like anywhere from $110 to $150, depending on the, the bedroom size. So we wanted to give you kind of an idea of, of how it looks for us right now. So I took a deeper dive. We have submitted a shortfall request to HUD. Last week, they required me to certify my restricted net position. It's back for their review. Um, they'll have some discussion items because there's some there's some items that they don't have us report in BMS that is also affects our restricted net position. So um, they're currently in review of that, and I, I guess that's a good thing because that means they're working on their end to try to get us some additional funds. So that would not be a shortfall. Um, so I took a deeper dive this weekend to kind of give you guys an idea of what we're seeing. So this yellow section, we'll work with the yellow section first. Um, basically what I'm seeing, um, on average, we're seeing about a 7.35% in contract rent um, for the landlords. What that means is our monthly charge effect is 67,814, and our annual charge is about 813. Now, we are, that is kind of staggered. This is kind of looking at it at a point in time. Um, and our PBBs had a considerable increase because a lot of them were not up to the fair market standard, and kind of went, <laughs> which was kind of a drastic um, increase. So about 17% there. So in total, our annual, our annual change is 1.2 million. Of that, a lot of a lot of what happens is if the tenant's already at their percentage, their thirty percent, unless their income changes, it doesn't change for them. It's always absorbed by the housing authority. So what we're seeing is this change 
affected maybe the tenants by $92,000, but it's affecting us by one point one dollars So um, we've never been in this situation. <laughs> Apparently other agencies have. Um, Boulder County says they've experienced this, you know, the number of times where they've been in the shortfall. Um, we requested, we're just waiting to hear back from HUD. Um, we were going to go to council um, this next Tuesday to probably bring our 2024 payment standards down to 90% instead of 100. But what we decided yesterday is that we're probably, it's probably too late in the game to do that because um, landlords have to submit for increases 60 days ahead of time. So some of these increases that are going to occur in September, October, November, really happens. Um, so there's really not, we're not going to hit very many people. We're going to affect this really small number of people. But what we will have to decide is if we're actually going to go down to the 2025 payment standards versus the and we may have to do it just based on budget, but we're kind of waiting on HUD's determination and what funding HUD gives us to see how our two-year tool ends out. To kind of give you an idea, we have about, so my my data is from September. I can only do September to be, um, because that's what's in the system. Even though they may have moved increases, they're not in the system yet. So to be able to track and analyze the data that's hit in the and I have to use September. So this is off of, off, off of September's numbers. We already have 313 managers that have moved to the 2025 uh, recertification process. So that means their increases are already in the system. And I have about 87 that show that have not. So this is this would have been the effect, but talking to HCD, there's so much more that's already been approved that's not in the system yet because they're still waiting for additional documentation from the residents, that this thing is probably way less than 87. And this is where it kind of was housed. So we had one voucher left that I showed still needed uh, still needed to be certified um, and had a September date. And then this is where that 87 falls. To kind of give you an idea of where our vouchers fall on a grand scale, is um, the first half of the year we had about 215 that we certified. And this is this is kind of how it can really affect your two-year tool. If you have a majority of your vouchers in the first six months, that's going to affect your two-year tool if it's not staggered out consecutively. <laughs> to you know, you'd have all that hit all in one month, and when you have all that hit in one month, say it's forty thousand dollars, that forty thousand dollar increases for the rest. Of um, here's kind of an idea of what, so here's what they did with the 2024 grant market increase. And we did receive emails from HUD saying there was, they realized there was a miscalculation. Um, and we think that also played into the 2025. So 2024, for example, a three bedroom was 2898, now it's going to be 2704, so they're dropping that. Um, probably because they're realizing so many housing authorities are in short bond. We were just talking with the HCD specialist today, and she actually saw it on TikTok. So, <laughs> oh my yeah, she saw it on TikTok this morning that, you know, they were saying, like, a lot of housing stories on a short call right now. So, in our budget process, we're going to have to determine what payment standard we're going to go down to and how it's going to affect and who it's going to affect tenant-wise um, for these increases. So, to kind of give you an idea of that, I took two completely different individuals. Um, this first one is a one bedroom. And what this is, is their contract rent right now is 1547. They have a utility allowance. The voucher is 1823. So right now they're under our fair market. And even if I did a 5% minimum increase for next year, they would still be under. So they're not going to be affected. The ones that are going to be affected are the ones that are only close to the fair market in 2023. So this individual here is an affordable community, and it's probably going to be those higher bedrooms that are going to be more affected than the low bedrooms. Um, this one's, um, their current rent with their contract rent and utility allowance is $3,459. they are already over $55. Um, 
However, if we drop it down, you know, they they could have to consume much more on the tennis side. That's more of their responsibility that will be able to pay for. So it's determining how we're going to process next year and what HUD gives us budget wise. We may have to go down to the 2024, and that has to be our standard. Um, what I am seeing is that the majority of um, what who's going to be affected right now is I have like 108 that tenants that in 2025 would be under the 2025 tenant standard. So that's what I kind of looked at was like how many how many vouchers right now today if we went down to the 2025 tenant standard are going to be affected and they're going to have to pay more out of pocket themselves. So I have about 108 HCDs and I have 68. So, so is that 17 percent? I mean, what is the increase actually going to be for the simple and age? It's it's different. It's They're different. all their own special snowflake. Okay. So it could be 26 bucks for one. It could be 300 for another. It all depends on their bedroom size. You know, some of them may be in a larger bedroom size, but they only have a one bedroom voucher. Mm -hmm. You know, so those probably could even have a, a, a larger increase with this, this effect as well. Um, so it's each, and it's, it's really hard to analyze because you don't know, one, what the landlords are going to increase. You can assume that, you know, it's going to be a 5% or whatever, but that's not what we're seeing today. And that, and the average 7%, like there's some that are going 15%, 20%, because they weren't anywhere near fair market, you know, yet, yet. And now we're knowing they can go up to that fair market. And, or taxes have caused them to have to go up and higher. <laughs> and their insurance, while, yeah. our apartment building just got dropped and the insurance carrier was like, yeah. yeah, just not even, not even we're going to raise it. We're just like, no. And so I don't know if that concludes the market or what, but we just shop it. And it was, we paid about $8,000 a year and I'm looking at about $18,000. We are going to see about <laughs> Eleven percent increase um, throughout on our insurances, and, and, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and we're starting to see um, we're starting to hear feedback that it's possible our current agency, which is more of a housing authority agency, it's a, it's an insurance company that specifically gives better rates to mm -hmm. housing authorities, um, that we're reaching a level because of the construction costs of these new properties like Village on Main and Ascent, they're too high. For them to insure us, they would have to get insurance to insure us, which so which means we'll have to go out to an unadmitted market. I know so much about insurance, sorry, <laughs> but you have to go out to the unadmitted market, and the unadmitted market is completely different. It's going to give us different thresholds for wind and hail. Um, we have to increase our buyback policies because um, even our current insurance company. They were back. Some of them were only at one percent and then they had they went up to two percent. When you have a buyback cost, you can try to get down to twenty five thousand dollars deductible. So it just it just skyrocketed that properties. Um ours was at a fifty something like that and it was fifty thousand dollars. And that would be eighteen thousand dollars a year. Ten thousand more is fifty thousand dollars. Basically it's a burn down policy. It burns down. So that's what we're seeing in our voucher program. I'm hoping that we'll hear something from HUD within the next couple of weeks. Um, but we did also receive a large percentage in the beginning. So, and the other agencies like Delaware County did receive as large as, I mean, we received a 16% increase in the beginning of the year. There are others who received like two or five. So I don't know what, how HUD's building their equation. They do have additional funding that's reserved funding for the shortfall. We submitted for it. Um, and that was which is kind of playing the waiting game. But we may have to make a decision sooner than later because um, we're up for budget. <laughs> <laughs> and I think in your numbers are too for the bigger units, what I've seen. So we've actually sold three new camping homes that were going to close on our next one next week. We just want to don't want to deal with it anymore. So those and those are all bigger Three and four bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So those were rentals for the last mm -hmm. 20 years that are no longer, will never be rentals again because the numbers don't make sense. So, we're gonna have to see so that'll be 
all the time. And so I actually had was showing one of my favorite events of duplex it has four bedrooms to someone yesterday who was lost their um, had a boulder county home that was sold in that tranche that they got rid of. And they got ninety days notice and they're at the end of their ninety days and they still have not because there are literally no larger units anymore because I'm not the only one that's yeah, yeah, the um, yeah, the lawyer that we use that does a lot of the country has and she's like the most the, the thing she's done the most is the ninety day most vacant She's like, I, I mean, I have so many. So those bigger units, those rents are going to go up because they're just they're non existent. So basically, my four beds, I can charge whatever I want because they don't exist. And there's so few. Well, I mean, that doesn't surprise me because one of the things that you talked about with the, the I mentioned the county and the more people is, you know, what we're seeing is the naturally occurring affordable housing is going. It's, yeah, it's, it's and, and so for us, we're going to have to start talking to the state because when we look at Prop 123, it included a naturally current affordable housing. But you can see in the home sales data I mean, that they're being sold because the median sales price is, is higher than the average sales price. Which is telling me that the lower cost homes are not in the market, and that's showing the wealth of the So, you know, my point to the county is, you know, the bigger problem is you can, we can look at what is it, the rental assistance programs. But who are you going to assist if you're losing product? And it's almost exacerbating when you build more product like we're talking about with the sale. Yeah, probably what we bought a few years ago. Yeah, I think three or four bags are huge. Yeah. Well, we're about to put in a year, put a bunch on the market. <laughs> so I have a question about village on the because you said now project finished vouchers are not going to be available there. Correct? Did they're I not that correct? They're not necessarily not available. We have a contract. It's we're probably gonna have to we're going to wait to see what HUD gives us. To see if what HUD gives us, we can um, utilize that and be out of this shortfall. Um, it was always expected that we entered as attrition. So, like, add five units here, five units the next month, five units. Um, <clears throat> and technically, I have been almost in the number of actors that we put them in, but it's also based on budget. So, they're still going to get them. It's just we don't know when. It's a time issue. issue, right? Okay. So part of it, like, so one of the things that we did with people that owed us money, mm -hmm. um, with failure to report accurate income and things like that. So we entered, we meet with them, and we enter into repayment agreements. Um, I have how many come to me? Five. Tracy is Tracy on. She. I have yes. a yes. How, yes, many, yeah. how many do we have coming to me to have the hearing on? Um, just one at this point. Okay. But how many letters did we send out? Termination letters, five. Five. So we're terminating five vouchers because they didn't adhere to the repayment agreement that we entered into with them in order to keep the voucher in. In that agreement, we're very specific to say if you fall behind on your repayment agreement, or if you think you're going to fall behind, you need to communicate with us. Um, and we've had one or two that, like what we were talking yesterday, we had one individual that had a car wreck, had other issues. I mean, they're in here immediately talking to us, and we're reworking their agreements based on the circumstances. These are individuals who didn't do that. And so, it's a different challenge for us because we can't keep letting people not communicate with us, not give us information, and then keep extending the voucher. And we know that there are people that are doing everything that they need to do, and, and the vouchers are in jeopardy. So, so I sent five letters. I've got one that is one 
and do it, but so all of that's now starting coming on. Too. So those vouchers then that possibly will be terminated would then be open for someone else or not? We would not be vouching. We would not. We would not. voucher them up on the HCB side. We would put them into that PPV bucket that we have dedicated. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we would we open up to another person in just a different way. We probably won't be vouchering that. Uh, the remainder of 2025, unless they give us a boatload of money. Just because we have a cent that have PDVs as well, that we need to add 18 that we need to budget for as well. So if they give us enough money, we're just going to ride the waves so that we have those ready to go and don't put ourselves in the short term. Well, what we're dealing with is a, this is really a systems issue that we're dealing with, in that, and, and, and we see it. I see it in a lot of different areas in that the systems were designed really for a period of normalcy, but to look at inflation, interest rates, and you know, we've been in a four year, five year period of, uh, from an economic perspective that is not normal at all. And so the systems in the way that they're designed can't keep up with the inflationary pressures and and then the funding components to those systems can't be funded. And I think that's inherently what all the housing authorities are dealing with. So it's a systems problem. In that they say do YouTube your tool, do it this way, evaluate this, you know, watch your numbers here, but when you're in this out of control market that we're in, the system breaks. And this is my first of learning how that works. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to do it too, Brett, because remember when we started talking about this, you can't get more money from HUD unless you show that you're vouchering up. So you have to ride that line with HUD to the point that, you know, we got 16%, others got two, because at the end, that's benefiting the whole. And so the problem that the housing authority had before is they were never vouchering so in this type of situation, you didn't have this issue, but you were never getting more money to increase the number of vouchers you have. So it's it's a it's as challenging a system as I've ever seen. But they need, they're going to have to rework those in order to be able to manage these crazy periods we go into. I think it would be kind of crazy. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. But. We're seeing in transportation funding. We're seeing. I mean, it's across the board, and you know these, these mechanisms just don't, aren't responsive to the challenges. So I have another question. I know that I think it's Boulder County that is selling off some of their affordable housing. Is any of that in Longwood? Yes. Yes. And does that affect vouchers? If they sell it, if if that was. Part of what is available for a voucher user, yes, and generally that is um, depending on. We we are still talking to them about what what the um, restrictions were on them, like how do they buy them, etc. How do they de restrict them, if at all, to see if that is just a general loss to our stock or not. I think the challenge they're going to have is what they're selling is is they came to us. And I was like, yeah, I'm not interested in selling these because the condition of these units are so bad mm -hmm. that, you know, the capital that you're going to have to bring in to make them, bring them up to date is significant. And I, you know, part of it is unless they're willing to really discount the price of the unit, if someone is going to buy it, I don't know how you can buy the unit, put the capital in the need to, and keep it affordable. It's impossible. Right. So, and they, you know, if they just, they, how much they discount it, you know, what kind of impact is that going to have on them? Because part of the reason they're doing that is because they're having financial issues. They're trying to finance other stuff. They're trying to finance other stuff. And so, it wouldn't surprise me that. For them to get a deal, it's going to be incredibly hard to do. 
affordable just because of the capital investment that you have to put into it at the end. Bring them up to date. That's my gut, thanks, Lynn. What we have seen. It seems like that's going to trigger some of the same insurance issues as well, right? Like if you're putting in that much capital, or you have to put in that much capital, you can get these to the position you need them in. Significantly not do a good thing. Mm -hmm. These are some numbers, but right. Mm -hmm. So just kind of makes sense. Okay, anything else? Although the taxes were for that next year. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know what we're receiving from taxes is going to go down next year. Ours is not probably. It's like seventy seven dollars or something now. So On the year. It's down, but not enough to make it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, resident quality of life. Anything there? So this is just for Melissa on board purposes. This is something we generally hold for the advisory board members to come up with items if you want. Um, sometimes we have some items here, but generally it's more of open call. So I have a couple of um, thoughts. And this has come up at some um, of the coffee with uh, coffee and conversation I think is what it's called meetings. Suppose that we were in a situation where the power were to go down, do we have generators at any of the facilities that we pick up on in particularly? Because I know uh, we probably have um, people that are on oxygen and that kind of a thing. So. Do we have generators, or is that not something that would even be cost effective to even think about? Uh, no, we don't have generators. No, I don't think it would be cost effective. Um, most of our properties are actually, I'm thinking, with maybe the exception of Briarwood, most of our properties are served by underground electricity. Electric utilities, which is when you look at the downtime that you have with those utilities when we have outages, is it, they tend to be pretty short. So, most of our outages that are longer in duration occur when we have overhead lines, simply because that's typically weather related and tree issues. Um, as we move in, and this is more of the city side, as we move into a, 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 there's two pieces in here, and I'm going to kind of talk more about electricity now because there's a lot of conversations about the move to 100% renewable energy. The reality is the state's requiring us to hit 80% renewable energy by 2030. So, really, the only thing that Platte River's doing that's different is saying we're going to try to gain the end of 20%. I say all of that because we're, we're beginning to test batteries. And Platte River's going to place the batteries at some of our substations. And, and so, assuming that it's not a line failure or lines that go down, most of our short outages tend to be very short duration. Now, what we probably need to do for the residents, and, and I don't know if we're doing this, is that we, um, if you have a medical issue that um, you need electricity for oxygen machines or whatever it is, we do have a system within LPC where we need to know who those individuals are because that does start adjusting how they'll approach it. And we do that for home in terms of what we're looking at. Um, the cost of generators. Um, hundreds of thousands of dollars to power a facility like this, and I don't know that you could ever really afford to do that. Now, all that being said, you know, with the scent near the village, village on what's it called? Village on Main. Just if we just say village, I feel yeah, like that's the best way. I always forget what the new name is. Village. Now what's changing that a little bit is actually bringing in solar. 
and, the, and how solar works with the buildings, because that starts getting at what you're talking about and what may end up happening is that it may be better to look at installing the battery component where we have solar on the buildings. And that may be the most cost effective way to provide short term backup for this, for this project. But, you know, we're replacing the two generators here and now they're larger. Um, but I had a $90,000 shortfall uh, based on what we already had budgeted because of the cost of the So that may be what we need to think about is really bringing in solar and solar battery. Um, and that may result in potentially some lower utility rates because when you look at building the renewable electricity, solar and battery is what you really need versus just solar. So, um, but that's something we can talk about partnering with Platte River and LPC is where we put batteries and, and how we approach it really gets into the distributed energy resources because then they can draw off their batteries as well. So it's not going to be something we'll do on our own, but I think that's probably the most cost effective way to do it. And the other thing that came up, which um, it sounds like what people are doing in some of these places is when they get rid of large items, um, so you're talking maybe TVs or even in the, um, computers and stuff like that, that they are putting them into the regular trash. Um, is there a way that we can not have that in the regular trash and maybe kind of accommodate those kind of items so that they go where they can be better than the regular trash? So that's usually, that's up to the tenant if they want there's ways you can call like debris haulers or Habitat Restore will come and pick up stuff sometimes if it's what they're looking for. But sometimes, like if it's, for example, a floral couch, nobody will take it. Goodwill won't take it. Habitat won't take it. The landfill is the only place for it to go. I'm sorry? Exactly. Like a, a hauler would take it. So that's not something, I mean, because it's so one-off, I don't know how we would accommodate that. Typically, a tenant is responsible for getting rid of their own larger items. Just So then we can't contract for that with our trash service necessarily. For well, no, because electronics are different, and that may be one thing. We use commercial hauling, right? Different. Commercial. We don't see. We, we do for our multifamily, the Western Disposal, etc. The city does not do we our. City does yeah. Our trash. Yeah. We would have to work with Western and or even our sanitation group in terms of really TVs, computers, things like that. You don't want those going in your waste stream anyway because of the things that are in. And you know, for the city, we do hard to recycle events and things like that. But we would probably have to talk to, you know, Bob and Charlie as well as Western to figure out can they collect them in a different container that they'll pick up. But then that's all in the products. Um, we, did, we did do across the properties last year uh, those big, you know, events yeah. where we, we brought the service in. For on behalf of residents, but I think in one-off situations, I don't know how we could organize and, and cover that. So then I guess maybe the message needs to be because what I've heard is when the question has been asked, the answer is always just dump it into the regular trash. So yeah, I guess maybe the answer is a little bit different. But I don't know. Maybe we could at coffee conversations talk about what haulers are out there who can call. So that could be an education thing. 
And you can let them know, actually, one that makes it super easy through the app. There's an app you can get that gives you all the dates for hard to recycle stuff, um, that kind of thing. So you could suggest that they look into that. Like, I just pulled it up after remembering that, and there's like one on September 25th, one on October 2nd. So that'll give them, I mean, it's not immediate, right? But some time frame for when they could maybe more easily get this stuff out. Okay. Um, we did disaster recovery, we got three different inputs, three really separate inputs. So, theoretically, we can have a good one. Yeah, so we have four different lines coming in from Platte River. And so, typically, when we have outages, that's why a lot of them are short duration because we're moving transformers. We're sh switching the flow of power as fast as we can to isolate it into a specific location. And so, I mean, last time I looked, I think our outage time is averaging like 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. And so we're a little bit different than Excel. Um, you know, when we get into high winds, for example, we we switch our system. So our system will automatically do this. It'll reconnect automatically when it trips a breaker or something to shift the load and start moving it. Like when we're in high winds, we turn that off so that it'll stay de-energized until we can figure out what is actually causing the situation. So, um, you know, Different substations, I can't give you the specifics, especially with the recording going. <laughs> but we have, to, we, we have multiple sources coming in, and then we work with Platte River in terms of their main systems coming into our community. And so, for the most part, we can isolate pretty narrow. The only time we've really had, a, since I've been here, where we've had a really big issue where it was a larger area is where we uh, had a car um, at um, Homer and Nelson go over the ditch and hit the big transformer there because that was a connection point. And we lost the big area because of that. We you know, addressed that issue uh, in terms of how that works. So, yeah, we're kind of lucky because we don't experience it long by long. People experience outside of long. You did. Yeah, you did. And we were talking about that reconnection thing because it went off and then went on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do what? Do you know how much of the code you have for people on the site? Or is it 10 people that's been on the site? That's, I think, the work we need to do is to understand who, and that's what our property managers need to work on, is really who, who is on a system that needs electricity for no reasons, and then we need to get that into OC so that when we're seeing the outages, they can have that in their database. Okay. Any report, update on operation. So Lauren is out today, ill, and she provided an occupancy report that's been added on to your agenda. So this is what we'll present to the board next week as well. Um, overall, our occupancy rate is 94%. Um, you can see that for, well, if you were comparing from, from last month at Village on Main, we have added, we've been leasing up in, in full force because we held those several units empty to be able to use during construction and now they're renovated and ready to go. So we're getting that, those numbers up. And then Aspen Meadows neighborhood um, is our lowest occupancy, but that's really, well, I should say actually right with both together. We're um, uh, reopening up 
remediated meth units and trying to get those in the scene. And plus, those are just smaller properties, so the percentage is more affected by just one unit. Um, other than that, if there's any questions on this, I'll be happy to answer them or convey to the property management team to get back to people. But I don't have a ton of detail. So, Lauren and I have been talking about how to really shrink the turn time on these units. And one of the things that I'm evaluating is looking at uh, the interest that we have. Because one of the things, one of the council did say housing is we put the majority of our, our, our dollars into housing. And so what I'm trying to evaluate is that, that do I have an ARPA interest to potentially look at a contract with someone to come in and turn the mix mm -hmm. so we can just get everything turned all at once, rather utilizing the contract, yeah, rather than having staff, and then rebalance the system so that we can get all the turns and staff. Um, you know, to a certain extent, I, I talked to Lauren, I haven't had a chance to talk to Kendra about this, but one of the things I want to start doing is actually evaluating um, the units when, they're, when it's time to turn them and, and really figure out, is that a unit that we want to turn to staff or would it be better for us to look at contracting that term? Because where we tend to run into issues where it takes a long time, obviously not. But it's not uncommon for us to, to get into units where they're incredibly bad, and, uh, and in some cases just as bad as a meth unit, because of many other things that I won't go into detail for. And, and it may make more sense for us financially to contract that out versus expect our staff to do it so we can get it rented as soon as we can. And I think we just need to start doing an economic evaluation on how long is it going to take if we do it internally versus how long will it take to contract it? And then how long is it going to be unrentable and figure out, you know, what's the ROI on that? What's your average turn time? On a meth unit? No, just kind of average move out. Like, say you have a move out that needs, you know, what's your, what's your move? The goal is 10 days. It's over a it's, it's more than that. Yeah, it, it, it takes me more than 15 days to turn that unit on. Yeah. I mean, yeah, 10 would be for an average move. For an average move. Yeah, and some of them are not, we have a lot that are not average for that, but um, that is, I mean, that's the goal we've been trying to get to for a long time. Mm -hmm. Because there's lost lease days. Yeah. Right. And especially as we get later in the year, because if we've had a unit on the line tech side, if we've had a unit that's been occupied through the end of December and it becomes open. If it's still open at the end of the year, Kendrick, correct me if I'm wrong, if it's open on December 31st, if it's down, unrentable, unrentable, then it impacts the investment. And so there's a timing component too on this is, you know, when we start getting into November, December, we need to get those units current as fast as we can because then that creates tax implications for the investor. But then they can come back to us and say, we need to pay them. So, so we've been spending some time on that. Lauren's got a really, I mean, Lauren's really getting a good handle on this. We're working on showing things with maintenance, um, you know, to be frank, they're, they're not really happy about this, but um, we're making them really well priority and getting things into the system. Uh, Patrick's done a really good job of, of staying on those unit terms. Um, so, really, just forcing accountability. I mean, that's. Are you going in before, like when you know what you're vacating that potentially might have a problem? So you're identifying like a checklist before the move out happens? Because I definitely always go in 
would give a more sort of more and then have to notice them that I I already have like literally day of move out I've already got contact with some of those things because I'm already aware. Yeah. I, I think like they I, I do know that when they can. I think they do that when they can. I think most of our issues are when we're in an addiction mode. Yeah, well, you don't know when it's an addiction mode. Yeah, and when I'm looking at these numbers, bad ones have been the result of that. I think typically an addiction, a death, I mean, that, that's what really starts kicking our tails. In. Um, these are all connected. So, yeah, the, like for the meth contamination, that makes sense to me that it's taken a long time. But it, I think what you're talking about, like the, some of the bad move up numbers, like one of the units being down for like 165 days um, for something like that, for a resident passing away. Um, I mean, the, those numbers just seem high even in that case. Like, what is the clock starting? I, I guess that's maybe a dumb question, but. Yeah, for like 165 days, is that like when we know that we're going to have to go through a more extensive process or? So, I can, I can speak to one of which is yeah. just happened. The, the individual passed away. Um, family came in and they boxed stuff up. They never gave us the keys. Mm -hmm. We could never contact them. They would give a whole group of family. So then if they don't ever relinquish the keys, then we have to go through the eviction process. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, that extends. The period. Um, I think they, I don't even remember if they even actually gave us something and then we had to go through the eviction, but then we had to incur the cost to remove because they never came back for the boxes or the furniture. So then we had to dispose of that and we had to give notices to those people to say, hey, you know, all you, all these items are going to be destroyed, you know, and send letters out. But that's in, in those such certain situations that's what happens with some these and if they have no next to kit then you have to go through the eviction process and even though you know they may have passed away of the unit and you called the ambulance and there's the unit and they had no emergency contacts from next to kin, you have to go through those processes to to obtain possession on the other end of the scale just going through the notes here we have 12 units that are just pending make ready status yeah. I feel like those are the ones that we could bring in a contractor and just get ready to rock. Mm -hmm. Plus a couple of, there's others that are like, yeah, not quite to that point where we've got like vacancies coming for those two. Do you think those are just like cleaning peak perfect? Not, I, I would think, because we, we specify here if some are waiting for like flooring or something like that, mm -hmm. I think it's more just clean and turn. Just yeah, yeah. Right. It's just been, it's a, been um, strapped on vacancy. And that's something we're, we're trying to figure out in the budget is, so you have a maintenance person for each building. And so as they're trying to turn the units, they're also giving the maintenance cost. Mm -hmm. and, and so then what that looks like, and that's part of what Lauren and I are talking about when Patrick gets back, um, uh, how we figure out how we can staff it really, because there's just a lack of Capacity. One of the things we will be evaluating this budget is can we get another maintenance person? Because um, that may happen. And in every unit, every building is different. You know, there are uh, buildings where you know every day you're going to have a unit that you're going to have to unplug the toilet. Mm -hmm. And it's the same unit every day. And it's not a short bridge. And, and, and so, depending on which building we're talking about, we have different issues that we're managing on a daily basis. Didn't your contract get to clean to clean the units? They don't have one. That's exactly what we're trying to get into is to me, you know, what you want to do is you want to look at the value of your maintenance staff and what's their cost per hour versus what's the cost per hour of the cleaning staff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the conversation we're having. So if you were to get another uh, maintenance person, would that free up Patrick Bill to just be, really be the supervisor? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I think that's pretty good. Yeah, it would be that. We've also 
talked about, they, they've recommended that maybe we look at another custodian position to do what you're saying, right? Instead of cleaning the buildings, we have one that has the capability to come in and clean, but I'm not sure that the ROI makes sense of that either. And so that's what we're trying to keep. I feel a lot cheaper than the light. And sometimes I end up doing it myself to do a quick, quick turn, but gas would be. Yeah. I mean, we'll do a three to two bathroom, 250 bucks. Even if it's dirty, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's pretty cheap to actually have it. You're kind of yeah. getting it done, you know, in a couple of days instead of 10 weeks. I don't know why there in that. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't say I, 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 I rarely ever charge. I rarely ever get a bill from what I mean, it has to be really gross, like, to to get over to. I know Andrea's got coins that are like hourly rates, so it's going to take me an hour, it's going to take me four hours. Yeah. Yeah. How deep clean do we have to clean? <laughs> so, yeah. we have, I mentioned about I have the technology cabinets yeah. there. And what our maintenance team has told us is that's just not their strong suit. I was going to say, how do you maintenance? Like, it's, like scrub the toilets? I don't know how that's So, yeah. Yeah. So, we're talking through that uh, in terms of what is the best approach. And my one best is like standard. <laughs> well, I mean, if you look at it, and, and I can just quick math on it, and it takes maintenance stuff, one way to clean it for other calls for service, it's more expensive for us to use our staff. I guarantee it would be a lot cleaner than <laughs> 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 having a maintenance student come in and be like, I don't know, right? Yeah. I'm not sure what to get up here. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you would mind sending us the name of the company who you work with or names. So I've got private gals, probably not. Oh. I don't even know if they're licensed or insurance, so probably wouldn't work for you. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sure we should get with purchasing yeah. and do our surgery. Yeah, exactly. Contracts. Do an on call and on call yeah. yearly yeah. contract. Yeah. 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 I'm just trying to figure out who to send it to. So just have a. <clears throat> And uh, you've probably gone over this several times, but what's the deal with the Aspen neighborhood? I think it might be four days. That was a meth contamination that insurance did not cover, and we've had to cover that ourselves. Uh, we have made the call. We have enough in reserves, and we just got a quote from the con contractor that Habitat works with, um, and he did good work for us. He did the first round of what we needed on that unit, so we're just getting it done. Just to to using our reserved funds because that was just a, it was a big rebuild and we just had to pick it off as we could afford it and no insurance. So is there anything going on with the um, flooring over there at Aspen Street? Yeah. Um, so the flooring subcontractor and the installation contractor have worked out um, a proposal. They are negotiating with the architect right now to see who would take some of the responsibility for this um, and then they're bringing it to us. So I have not seen it yet, but this is all an attempt to resolve this um, outside of having to take legal steps. So um, we'll see what that looks like. But the idea was everybody was trying to reserve time with their folks to get the work done in about October. And of course, we need some lead up. We need to prepare residents. We need to work, figure out what happens with residents' items and where they go and how long it takes. And so there's some work to be done, but um, it's in negotiation. Well, so we just, um, was it last week? Last week, Eugene, just um, our city attorney's office just read the phone. Um, got counsel to authorize special counsel for construction defects. Same group right mm -hmm. Um So, yes, that's part of the conversation. Is what's the cost? And I, you know, Aspen Meadows is a little bit different in that 
we're not losing units and we're, there's not a business loss associated with flooring. So it's kind of hard to say there's a cost that occurred. What we said is we're not paying a dime for this. And that's really the fight that is that we're dealing with on this one. Were you talking about that one specifically, or that including meth units? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, often. I understand the balance in that. Yeah. For living in our properties, uh, I mean, it, the end step is going to collections of which we never see it typically, but we can't always go after them because sometimes we cannot con confirm that would stand up in court that it was them that did it. Um, if they weren't the, the only tenant that ever lived there, or if we didn't have a certified clean before they moved in. Um, and then often we don't find them at the meth until after they're gone. <clears throat> so if, when we do have, when, when it is possible, we pursue it, but it just is rarely It's a bad one. Yeah, and yes. They have been typically from evictions, where, but still, more often than not, we found that evidence afterwards, not just before. It's not meth. <clears throat> well, there's a few that. that it's happened. Has. There's yeah, a few that it has. There's times. also been a handful, or a handful, not a person, three or four, that were evicting for another reason, and they're in the middle of the eviction. And see it and then that's that's when the that hits us in between the pipes but and what's interesting on this where we're gonna have to be really in tune I saw something on a social media platform where the, there was a group marketing to potential home buyers and real estate agents to perform a meth test before you close all house. So somebody's now turning that into a, a market, which um, I think they said even before you did that, which is going to be an interesting thing. But Sarah can talk about what she's talking about that because we may have had the solution. Okay. Yeah, so I met with a company that's called Telegar in Bluefield. I guess he's been around over 20 years and a retired firefighter. And they have um, basically a, a spray that they've been selling to the federal government. Um, it cleans anthrax, it cleans any type of meth that, you know, you name it, it turns it into a biodegradable on the wall. Um, so he has a pretty Pretty interesting um, concept, and he's been doing this for several years. And um, fire departments can buy this product so they can put it on their bunker gear, and so they don't. I mean, essentially, takes the you know the chemicals out of the bunker gear, so they can reduce the chances for cancer. Um, so we have a small sample of this product that, that we're going to hopefully use on the bathroom, um, and then. Really, he wants, he's offered to come up and clean our bathrooms for us. Mm -hmm. So, um, really getting them in front of you is what I need to do. And, um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. And he can't, he, he doesn't go too much into detail about his government contracts, but he's been working with the several different federal departments. So, in other words, selling this product. and. He was saying something about like the the, it's the president or the party the what the center or whatever say they don't have a group that go in and just clean the room with this product before they go and spend time. Yeah. So basically you spray on the wall, you let it sit for fifteen minutes, you squeegee it off, and then you take like a shaving cloth and wipe it down and you're done. So, and it, so it's, the, the testing shows that it is under the 25 requirements. On all sorts, that's like it's good for. Yeah. Well, he needs a permit. 
that one I think is a good spot. Yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> then Sarah met him through the guy from New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And this guy's just in Broomfield. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're doing, I mean, part of the connection is, is to see if this works. Because if this works, then what we will probably start doing is, in, as part of the clean return, we will use this, and we'll have to play with it a little bit, test it, and then that lets us put the map back in the units. Because then it's a clean unit. Yeah. Clean carpet would be, but we can do it because we had a couple of before, and we could get spray on that. Yeah, yeah. 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 you could. I think any solid surface, just what it sounds like, any solid surface is work right. So, and in most cases, where it's the worst, and what we've seen, it's in bathrooms. Um, so, so we've talked about if it works and he comes and uses it, then what we will do is look at splitting the cost with the city and the housing authority. They have these big backpack systems. We're splitting the cost because we may just do it on the we're about to put in metal detectors when I'm at home in our restrooms. And so we don't need to clean the you know, the kids and we bring that in and clean it. So maybe something to split the cost of. They did indicate that the backpacks are an option, but um, his other it's like a rolling tarp. Um, that's what he would suggest for these rooms. Yeah. Because I was like, oh well, I was, I was very focused on the backpack because of the mobility of it. And he's like, yeah, that's we're going to use this long term better to, and obviously we need to hold that price in. Yeah. No. So, how should we use that piece of that? Or is that like. So, it's like a, a backpack that it has a, a container yeah. in it. I was just curious in it. Bring it yeah. out. And it has a, a hose that you use to spray. And how much do I have? Okay, I was just curious. Since I would like that. It's a white foam when it comes out. Mm -hmm. okay. I didn't get that far. <laughs> so I'm guessing we're just looking at it for meth, and we can test, you know, its efficacy if it's working for meth. But you mentioned it's like fentanyl, and it seems like it has pretty broad usages. Oh, yeah. So is that something that we'd be? Are we looking at using it just beyond just you know units that are down with some meth? Like, is it something that could help us? Yeah, like another thing, you know, I'm thinking of fentanyl, but something like Possibly. Yeah. So we could, like, expand it if it, if it works, if it's going to Yeah, like, if we got into, the, like, one of the units that it was a 40 unit, that's why we went on conviction, and then they get five feet in and start seeing everything. Assuming, he, yeah, anytime you tend to see meth, you can probably assume fentanyl is going to be there. You would want to just use this generally um, to do that. I mean, it makes sense, right? So he's a firefighter. He probably came from the hazmat team, and we're used to doing decon on some really harsh chemicals that have fires, and so he's just using the same thing he did to deal with arsenic and all the other materials that comes out of the fire. So he's just using it for that. It makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. I apologize, I have to take off. My dentist asked me to come in half hour. Are we good though? It's so good. So I have one question. Since we're in the time of year when everybody's going to be super good, we're going to be over shots. Is there any way to do it? Yeah, we did that with COVID. Yeah. And then, um, when, when Lauren gets back, I know Kaiser goes in and they're dealing through their off profit to do activities with them. One of the things I've, I've talked to Ryan Roman from UC Health, we kind of talked about things that the city, UC Health, and LUH can work on collectively that is not in their competitive environment. And we talked about like heart health bringing, you know, heart health educators into the facilities. Um, 
this is one I didn't get a chance to talk to him yesterday. This is what I was thinking about. It was, it's just something that to take two different organizations that are in fierce competition with each other, but we work collectively for the community. So we've been emailing about trying to get together. But yeah, that's definitely, I think King Supers was the one that did that. I think it was King Supers that brought in the COVID vaccines. We could also work with public health too. And so that may be something I talked about too. Right? I would be good for those people that don't have transportation plan for that. Mm -hmm. um, um, Sarah, do you have any more on public health and safety, or have you got to you yet? Yeah, right. yeah. It's okay. Um, real quick, back to that. Uh, it's called crystal clean, and it actually kills any mold, fungus, dead body decor blood borne pathogens and bugs or viruses. So, yeah. We need to connect with them. Um, did quick call for service for the past month. Um, knock on wood, it's even lower than prior months. So, Suites had 15. Eight of those four responded to. Um, Welfare checks and trespassing, some suspicious activity. Uh, Fall River had 10. We have uh, maybe neighbors kind of having issues with each other there. Uh, Spring Creek at zero. Village on Main at one. AMSA at three. AMN had one. The Lodge at zero. Barstow at three. And then uh, Briar, we had one. So, no. oh. pretty, pretty good considering all. Um, other than that, I have really no updates. Cameras are, my hair is still attached to my head. <laughs> um, we're working through that with uh, Everon. Um, we had to go back and get another contract due to how they propose it. With federal money, we have to have itemized lists, um, and it was not itemized. So, waiting for that so we can push forward with purchasing and then just get the equipment ready and purchase before the end of October. Village of Maine, it looks like cameras will be installed at the end of this month, for sure. They're working on the cabling right now with Dan Hill um, with the server piece and just working out those little details before it's, it's put in. Um, and that's about all. Any okay. questions? One of the things that's nice about Village on Main is that I've had to say this before is that when they have stayed or paid with that, they work outside that, which really is. It's not pink. No. And it really looks, it blends in with the angry a whole lot. It does. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Really does. I watched them do that for a while at time and I thought, I don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. And they, they don't. It looks Carol, do you have? I think I've covered everything that we're working on other than going in the budget. So obviously you know, we have the sense that it's going to be a, another tight budget. And so we're working on that. Um, hopefully by October 8th we get a sense from the uh, county in terms of how they're going to work at the crop one budget and what we can do there. Um, I was in a meeting with them last week and there's a lot of different models that are being thrown out. Um, one model, just so you know, was a dedicated amount to the housing authorities. Um, I took a slightly different approach and said dedicated to the city, so then the city and then require the city to allocate it to the housing authorities because um, my concern is, is that it's not enough money do anything and we're still going to go to the cities to help bridge the gap and if we're not careful what's going to happen is the money can come in with the city system and then we'll bridge the gap on things that will be home ownership for example and then you don't have enough money on the housing authority side to then actually carry a project out 
In our case, it's less of an issue because we're so intertwined with each other we talk. But I think in other cases, that could potentially be a problem if the cities aren't talking to the housing authority. At some point, the, you know, the other file will drop and somebody's not going to have money for a project. So I was really pushing, give it to the cities and then make sure they're allocating it to the housing authority, which for us we can do. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll know soon what the approach is going to be on that. And, um, you know, if it works, there's a project where we're looking at that is affordable and attainable, which is a little bit beyond our mission. But if we can do it and do it in conjunction with the city side, what that does is actually creates an ongoing revenue stream over time that can potentially help with these issues. Um, because our margins are so narrow and poor, we can't accrue the money you need for capital replacement and things like that. So, we're going to have to get really creative and figure out how we can get margins in another way that benefits the entire system. And I think that's the attainable housing world. So we'll see how that goes. But it's, it's going to be dependent on the one b funding because I need that direct allocation in order to secure the debt and the debt ratio so that you can get essentially um, a rated interest rate, which um, interest rates on construction, if you were just going to do a, a traditional revenue bond or COP just on construction, they're probably in the neighborhood about a month and a half ago in the neighborhood six and a half percent. If, if you can get a rated interest rate that is akin to government interest rates, it's four and a half percent. And so that two percent difference makes a big difference in how you structure the capital and millions of dollars and so you know that's we're just waiting to see what happens and then you know if interest rates do go down you are not know, talking four and a half you're talking three and a half and, four. And, and that really can create some capacity and long-term funding sources for the housing authority. So if you are in a construction interest uh, situation if it went down do you automatically go down and it would stay the same? So if it was at the five and a half, and it went down to four and a half, would you be able to go down? Or are you it tied depends, into It depends. That? It depends on when you go into the deal. Sometimes when you issue standard debt on the government side, they'll say, well, you can't refi it in mm -hmm. X number of years. And so it's it's really the deal structure that's going to indicate what that looks like. But, you know, Molly, we've talked about it. I mean, this is one example, but what we figured out is, you know, if we have property that we can get, we can use both attainable and affordable housing funds. If we use affordable housing funds on the property, we can't do it. But if you use both, and you have this, what you what you end up doing is your your collateral is really the building. You're buying the debt coverage ratio with putting the fund in place. What that then does is it shifts the interest, and so what you're what you're pulling out in terms of revenues really is paying for housing. It's generating more revenue. And so it's something we're trying to figure out. It's not just this one I'm talking about. There may be other areas we can look at. And, uh, and what it does is it just creates a different funding source in the system. Typically, it starts at around year seven. So it's not immediate, but you do pull immediate funds in and develop. So. Okay, we're down to other business. Do you guys have anything on it? I think they really want to talk about it. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know how the last good for company conversation was on the last couple I went to the seated the team to the first the only person there presenting was the property. And they were getting smacked around for the year. It's just my impression was 
a communication is very you know, they're too close to the evidence. Mm -hmm. you know, it should be somebody from the judgment that's going on and you know, a more business standpoint. It's not probably yeah, so I go in quarterly. Um, so I hit each property quarterly. I think, you know, the challenge is right now, um, and once we get the regional property manager hired, they will be there with him. Yeah, and part of the challenge is Lauren and her schedule right now just because issues pop up, whether they're personal issues or something. And so, yeah, long term, it's the regional property manager that should be there with the property manager. You're right. So on my coffee and conversations, and thank you, Arlen, for sending me some of the dates because I've been trying to go to more. Are they, are they online somewhere and I just can't find them? Or if, if Diana, not, Diana, Diana needs to send her name on. Oh, yeah. She yeah, sends those out. Well, they, they, Resistant. Okay. Um, I don't have them on my home, but I can definitely get them over to you. Oh, that'd be great. Well, that's the other way that um, residents and people know about having conversations is through the LHG newsletter. So if you're not subscribed to the LHG newsletter, it's really, it, I'm I embarrassed. Can, I can definitely <laughs> get you that. Like, okay, well, great. And Thank you. you. Thank you. Why don't we just add the entire board? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. You want to you want to get it on the calendar because. Three times last year I showed up and it was canceled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can always get the cancellation. Right. Yeah. So I'll bump it back onto what he's saying. I, I agree with that because I try to attend as many of the conversations as I can. I think they are so used to having a property manager there that when somebody else is there, they feel much more comfortable asking some different questions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that will eventually come up here. But I want to. Um, and I wasn't sure whether I wanted this on the camera or not, but I, the last few that I've attended has at Kaiser Bay. And I've been to other ones where Kaiser has been, in, and so I'm kind of trying to figure out, in my mind, why it is that, why, why they're even there. Um, because what I saw was, they came in, they said, if you guys have any questions, we're here. Um, of course, they gave them ice cream, and that's the reason why they were there. They got ice cream. Um, they didn't have any questions. It was a great socialization for the people there. Um, and then the one Kaiser lady decided that she'd ask all these kind of fun questions. You know, have kind of a fun <clears throat> time with them, and that was great. But those are the questions I ask every time. Our people are not nursing home people. Our people are looking at, know what's going on in the city, they know what's going on in the nation. They can answer those questions, they hear them every time. So I don't, I'm trying to figure out if Kaiser's coming in, is anybody else coming in, or why is Kaiser, why is Kaiser coming in? When I don't see it. Either. I think that was something that Lisa scheduled. Their nonprofit would come out and offer to do this. Um, and I think it was originally proposed that like healthy or wellness, Aspects and so if they're not doing that, then we'll get Lauren to talk to them because that's what it's supposed to really be about. Is so Carrie was there, yeah. Some of it. So yeah, yeah. No, they don't really interact with the people at all. And I mean, ice cream—they're giving them ice cream. Of course, you're going to come for that. Right. But no, I didn't see that. I didn't see wellness. Yeah. 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 A while back, I don't know why I brought it up. Um, is there a way that we can ensure that the people that are at our facilities that are not going to be able to, <clears throat> and this is back to voting, they want to be able to vote in the election coming up. They either need to have them stand for there. Is there a way we can get their ballot to the box? And we know that that's probably a no no. Yeah, I don't think we can. We just want to know. Yeah, in the box. How we can kind of ensure that they. You, you can only drop them off people's. You can drop them up to 10 people's, I believe, is the rule in Boulder County. And I wouldn't 
My opinion is not worth one. Yeah, you get mixed up with transporting yeah. info. No, because they're not open. Yeah, it depends on where you put it. Um, I mean, they can mail stuff from there, right? Yeah, they're open to I mean, is there a piece of mail drop off there, right? They know they can't mail. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, like, I would think they would just put it in the mail drop. It's kind of dicey. I don't know that we could buy stamps or not. I mean, it, because it's, there's so much government funding in this with the election, I'm be hesitant to even step into that world. Because the likelihood of them tripping the rules <coughs> we're not aware of is pretty high. Okay. Okay, about the topic of conversation, is there any way to get us the code to get into these codes? We stand outside a lot. Yeah, the, yeah, the code do. actually <laughs> got um, changed so I can send it out to the board um, so that you can still have access to the companies. <laughs> Is there going to be a rate increase for the people that just say sign up for their leases? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what percentage was it? Well, we haven't yeah. gotten into the budget yet, so we haven't talked about it, but yeah, my guess is that. Usually it's not over five percent. We do it here, so fifty five or more is what we do. Karen or anybody, did you guys have any questions? Okay. Josh sent an email to us about if he's got who's on the new people. Josh, right? Yeah. Is in a new, do you have that? Yeah, he's yeah. in a new position where it, he cannot attend a 9 a.m. meeting um, because of a different meeting. He got, so he was wondering if we could possibly start meeting a little bit later. I think he even said like even 9.30 would work. Um, so Paul and Molly's idea would bring it up for a discussion if you guys would like to change um, meeting time or keep it as is and, and give them the option to do it. Anything about the lunch? I'm flexible, but I don't know. He said, back to 9 30 or 10, whichever. And he could come right be on Zoom. I mean, it doesn't make any real huge difference. I um, he didn't specifically say it, Zoom or in person, but it would just allow him to be able to join. So are you all open with nine thirty or ten? Mm -hmm. I started nine thirty, but I looked at ten. At 9 30 or 10 doesn't bother me on a Tuesday because I typically come in later on a Tuesday knowing my Tuesday night can go till two weeks ago I went till two I didn't go off till two thirty. Oh, okay. Well they do but they can vote to extend it but but yeah I didn't go off till two thirty I fell asleep at four. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So yeah, it's a um, so yeah, Tuesdays I do. Okay, so you let us know. Okay. So I just need a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. Second. You're not in favor, we're going to join anyway. <laughs> See you next time.